A lot of people struggle with flow, particularly in technical writing for papers or even books and presentations. It's really hard for people to tell if their writing flows or if their presentation flows. What do we even mean when we say the word flow? A lot of people, because they get frustrated with flow, they just don't pay attention to it. But flow is perhaps one of the most important elements of communications. People will forgive ugly graphics. They'll forgive imperfect language, misspeaking, bad grammar, or at least moderately bad grammar, misspellings, plot holes, and lots of other problems, as long as the flow works. The flow is what allows us to suspend disbelief and enter into a narrative. So perhaps the hardest part of flow is to get ideas or from ideas to a story. What are the practical ways we can create a flow? To begin, there are only just a few narrative structures in all of literature. We're really only concerned most of the time in technical communications with three of these. The first would be linear. I start at the beginning and move towards the end, whatever the beginning and end are. The second is circular, where I start at some point, I go through a story arc, and I come back to the same place where I started. The third is sort of a subset of linear, which is parallel. I have a series of parallel things that I'm talking about or series of events that I am going to interact that interact with one another and I'm going to make them pull together in the end and bring them to a conclusion. Now, speaking of conclusions, there is another aspect of narratives you need to understand, and these are plot structures. The first of these is the Fichtean curve shown here. So in a Fichtean curve, we begin at the beginning, because that's always a good place to begin. And then we have this section called the rising action. So the rising action is where we're building tension. We're setting up a problem in effect that needs to be somehow resolved. A lot of people don't understand that the problem-solution format is endemic to engineering. Everything engineering does is about finding problems, breaking the problems down, and then solving those problems and bringing them back together into a system that solves the original set of issues. This problem-solution architecture, this problem-solution way of thinking about things is not only the way engineering works, but it's also the way you should communicate. So once I go through the rising action or where I build tension, I come to what's called the climax. This is where everything turns. This is where everything is somehow the way forward suddenly becomes clear at this point. Then I have what I call my falling action, where things are being consolidated. The hero is on his way home, etc., etc. Then I have my final resting place or my end. And this is again, consolidation, understanding lessons learned, things like this. Now, another way of looking at this curve is the hero's story. Again, I have a beginning. Then I have a quest into the unknown. This quest causes me to have discovery and to learn things, which then ends up in a climax, which then results in falling consequences, and then finally a consolidation or a return. Again, one way to model technical communications, in fact, the best way that I know of to model technical communications is with problems and solutions. Okay, I want to start with my problems and I want to find solutions. By the time I get to the end of my communication, I want to be able to offer my audience a solution or a set of solutions. How do I use these things in technical communications? Aren't these just for fiction writers, like novels and, you know, fairy stories and stuff like that? No, these are actually very usable 
in technical communica communications. It's very hard to explain how, but what I can do is give you some examples. So let's do look at a couple of examples. The first of these is going to be a failure post-mortem, where I'm going to take a failure, I'm going to break it down, I'm going to figure out what happened, and I'm going to then offer a set of solutions or help people understand why this solution was the right one. Of course, I always have my beginning, and this is the state of the system before the failure. Now I'm going to have my rising action, which is going to be the results of the failure. What applications weren't working correctly? What things weren't going right? What could I not do? What could the business not do? These are setting up my tension. These are points of tension that are going to push me to resolve this problem. A second thing that falls into this rising action area is the troubleshooting process. What do I do to go about figuring out how to solve this problem? How do I interact with other groups? What did I measure? What did I discover from those measurements? This is effectively the story of the troubleshooting process itself here in this rising action. The climax, I'm going to say, is my root cause discovery. I suddenly discovered what the problem was. I understood it. I hit the broken router. I hit the broken switch, the broken protocol, the, the failed implementation, the memory leak, whatever it is, I found it. This is my climax. Then I have my falling action over here. And this is going to be the initial set of things I did to correct the problem. This is where I put in my temporary fix. Then I'm going to have my resolution down here, and this is going to be talking about a permanent fix. If I'm in a linear format, I start with the problem, I tell a linear story, I come out with a permanent fix after the resolution. And I also want to know how I'm going to prevent this problem from happening in the future. Now, this could be a circular format. If I'm doing a circular format, what I want to do is I want to go through this entire process and come back to where I started. There may be nothing wrong with where I started. Those types of situations lend themselves to a circular format. Now, you might notice that troubleshooting and failure postmortems are the easiest things in the world, are the easiest topics to arrange into a flow. There is a linear flow. There's just a set of things I can do. I can throw things into specific parts of the curve and it just works. The problem and solution tend to just fall out of the troubleshooting process. So now let's talk through a design change. Design changes tend to be harder to fit into a flow. They're certainly never circular because you don't want to end where you started you want to end up someplace different. So these are always linear or parallel structures, plot structures. So how can I fit a design change into this kind of curve? I have the beginning, which is, of course, my current system state. This is where I am today. Then I have my rising action. Now, what does the rising action consist of here? This is what do I need to accomplish? What problem am I trying to solve? Remember, we go back to the problem-solution mindset, the problem-solution language. Things I might want to accomplish are, I want to avoid a future failure. I want to support new and interesting applications. I want to move my network towards being a platform that I can build a lot of other things on. The other parts of the rising action part of this are going to be obstacles and options. So I need to outline what my obstacles are. What are, what are the things that are going to stop me from making this design change? What are the risks? 
How are the, what are the risks and, and what are those risks going to cause? What are the potential fallouts of those risks? So these are the things I want to deal with in my rising action. The climax is, of course, going to be selecting a specific design. This is going to be my proposed design. Now, here in the falling action, I'm going to do things like, what were the alternative designs and why didn't I choose them? How am I going to resolve or counter the risk or the threat model, the, the things on my attack surface that I outlined or I observed in my rising action section. So a lot of people want to, when they're dealing with these types of presentations, they want to raise an objection or they want to raise a problem and they want to solve it immediately. You're better off to raise all the problems, build the tension in this rising action section, come to the climax, and then in this falling action section, solve the problems you've brought up in the rising action. This helps the flow. It draws the reader or your audience deeper into what you're talking about. Finally, I'm going to also in this falling action section, I'm going to talk about my deployment model. If this is not Greenfield, how do I get from here to there? What are the steps I need to take to deploy this new design alongside or on top of my existing network? Finally, in my resolution section, I want to talk about how this proposed change solved the problem. How does it move me towards creating a flexible platform? How does it help me to deal with the future and not just today? So while design is a bit harder to get into this problem solution and Fictian curve type of type of communications method or process, it is possible to do. A third example that is going to stand in for lots of different straight information transfer type situations is explain the operation of a protocol. Explain BGP, explain OSPF. I can tell you from watching a lot of videos and reading a lot of books, this is extremely hard to make flow. This is something that people really struggle with. We tend to fall into the information dump. I open the fiction novel and the first three pages are character descriptions, how tall they are, what the color of their eyes are, what they look like, what they wear, blah, 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 blah. You have lost your reader from the moment you start doing information dumps. In this case, Fitting it into a narrative flow or fitting it into a problem solution is hard, but it's more important than any other type of communications. Because if you want this person to learn the protocol, if you want your audience to understand how the router works or how DNS works or whatever it is, you really need to push the narrative so they'll be able to process it and understand it. Don't just expect them to memorize a bunch of random information and consolidate it later on. That's crazy. So here, what are we going to do? We're going to start with the beginning. What problem or set of problems does the protocol need to solve? What is my goal? What is the protocol trying to do? What is the system trying to do? The piece of hardware, whatever it is, what is trying to be done? Now, my rising action section is where I split this problem up. I broke it, break it down into its own little component problems. And I just try to tease out the full set of issues. So I look at things like, how has this, these problems been solved before? What are the component problems? What are the interaction surfaces? What are the potential trade-offs? What are the potential attack surfaces? Where are their potential failure modes? What do they look like? I'm going to build my tension here, just like I would with a fiction story, by going in and trying to tear things down and help people understand, help my audience understand what it is solving this problem that I started with is really going to require. Then I reach my climax, and much like in the design space, this is just going to be how the protocol solves 
its primary problem. Now, again, what we tend to do is information dumps. Oh, I'm going to tell you how it solves every problem. No, I only want to, at the climax, tell you how it solves the primary problem. This problem and this climax should be interrelated directly in my communications. Now I do my falling action. And this is where I'm going to solve my secondary problems. I'm going to look at all the sub problems I broke things up into. And I'm going to say, how do I solve that particular piece of the puzzle? Finally, I'm going to get down here to the resolution, which is just going to be reviewing how this initial problem was solved. Now, these protocol or operational types of communication are almost always either circular or parallel because you're always going to have a bunch of sub problems that you need to solve. The point is not to teach the protocol, but describe the problems the protocol solves, how it solves them, and how these solutions relate to other protocols. It may seem hard to do at first, but you can make every kind of technical communication fit into a narrative, particularly if you are dealing with the problem-solution mindset, not only for your work, but also for your communications. Troubleshooting and postmortems, easy to fit into a narrative. Design problems, moderately easy, can be difficult depending on the complexity. Protocol hardware, etc., very difficult to fit into a narrative, but probably the most important instance. Remember, never describe how something works. Always find the problem you're solving, focus in on the main problem, trace that problem, use it as a backbone for your communications. Address secondary problems and figure out what they are in your rising action, solve those problems in your falling action. These should always support the main solution. Never ask questions like, how does this work? How do I arrange this information? Explaining a protocol by starting with neighbor adjacencies or packet formats is a really bad thing to do. People are never going to remember it. Good questions to ask. What risk are there involved in this narrative, in this plan of action? How likely are these risks? How can I avoid these risks? How can we detect failures? What do failure modes look like? These draw the reader or the listener or the audience in and help them understand what you're explaining much more clearly.